I am Gay Ray and co-chairman of the Santa Fe O'Connor Institute for American Democracy. On behalf of our board of directors, I thank you all for being here tonight. Again, it's going to be a very memorable evening. I'd like to acknowledge all my fellow board members because this is a, this, we work very hard and we work together, the ladies of the court, the women auxiliary patrons, circle members, and Scott and Joni, thank you for being here tonight. The family represented, thank you, I appreciate that. This is the 40th anniversary of the first woman to serve on the United States Supreme Court, our founder of our institute, and this whole Sandra Day O'Connor that we are so proud of. I hope you had an opportunity to watch the PBS Monday Night American Experience film on Sandra. That was the first, um, it was after the done by the first last week. PBS has provided a brief clip to show this evening, and then our moderator, Patricia Rayford, uh, who partnered with Stellan Wilmer and the immediate past president of the American Bar Association, will lead us on stage, conversation with three women who witnessed history. This is quite an exciting program. There'll be a quiz on it at the end of it, so please keep your notes, because we talk a lot. We'll be here till about, oh, 9, 30, 10, maybe. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. It's going to be a wonderful evening. I'll never forget it. Thank you. It was a very intense experience, to say the least. Intense? Because? Because of all of the attention that was being given nationwide to the fact that finally, after 191 years, a woman had been put on the Supreme Court of the United States. It was a very difficult job, and it's hard enough to do without all the media attention being given to it. And frankly, uh, you and your colleagues paid too much attention to it, I thought. Why? Why well, shouldn't we have paid attention to it? Because it was a historic Yes, point. that's fine. But then let's move on and let's let the work be done. Uh, you can see the work that way because everywhere that Sandra went, the press was sure to go. Sure. The first woman ever to sit on the highest court in the land, Saturday O'Connor was meant to be a symbol. A gesture to women, proffered by a political party that had turned its back on their quest for equality. I am announcing today that one of the first Supreme Court vacancies in my administration will be filled by the most qualified woman I could possibly find. In her quarter of a century on the bench, however, she proved far more. <laughs> Confirmed amid the first salvos of the culture wars, O'Connor would find herself holding the court's center of gravity, striving to keep the law from radically changing direction and the country from going to extremes. Whether she actually bridged differences or merely papered over them would remain a matter of debate. But with consensus and civility, her defining creed she nevertheless became the most influential Supreme Court justice of her time. She was smart, and she was staggeringly energetic, and she could carry both roles, the conventional female role that made her not scary, and the tough-minded judicial role that made her powerful. She was the perfect first.
procedure that could lead to the first woman on the Supreme Court formally began today. The Senate Judiciary Committee opened confirmation hearings on the nomination of Judge Sandra Day O'Connor. When she arrived on Capitol Hill on the morning of September 9th, 1981, Sandra Day O'Connor already was the most talked about judicial nominee in American history. Judge O'Connor is known as a forceful, determined, no-nonsense woman who is not afraid to speak her mind. The brethren will no longer be the same as soon as she takes her place among them. For the next three days, she would also be the most watched. Are you ready? Oh, I hope so. Uh, no, I don't Only 51 years old, she could be a power on the Supreme Court well into the 21st century. There are more requests for press passes to her confirmation hearing than there were to the Watergate hearings. It's the first time judicial confirmation hearings have been run on TV gavel to gavel, and there are tens of millions of people watching. Everybody that had a television was tuned in because she was a figure of fascination. The notion of a woman on the court was so unusual. She was going to be different. A lifelong Republican, O'Connor had been nominated to the court by President Ronald Reagan and now strode into the hearing room on the arms of party stalwarts, Senators Goldwater and Thurmond. Judge O'Connor, I have a background for you to testify when you stand and be sworn. Her conservative bona fides seemed assured. As the first woman to be nominated as a Supreme Court Justice, I'm particularly honored. And I happily share the honor with millions of American women of yesterday and of today. Outside the Senate chamber, however, fellow Republicans denounced her. They were Christian conservatives, the vanguard of a mounting counter-revolution, forged by opposition to the Equal Rights Amendment and fueled by a generation's worth of liberal Supreme Court decisions, especially Roe v. Wade, the controversial 1973 decision that established a right to abortion. Looking at the Democratic platform, I know that Christ will not support that platform. Their votes had helped catapult Reagan into the presidency. The Supreme Court declared war on the unborn in America. The one thing he could do for us as president, the big thing, was to appoint new justices to the Supreme Court to turn this carnage around, to stop this slaughter. There was controversy following the president's announcement concerning O'Connor's positions on the issues of abortion and the Equal Rights Amendment. Is the first woman nominated for the Supreme Court too much of a feminist? Some right-wing groups think so. Sandra O'Connor is trying to keep their opinion from endangering her confirmation. One might inquire as to your general feelings on the rights of women and how that might be reflected in the public policy arena. It's on the subject of abortion. Would you discuss your philosophy on abortion, both personal and judicial? The personal views of a Supreme Court justice, and indeed any judge, uh, should be set aside. Judge O'Connor spent most of the day dodging specific answers. Turning to the subject that I'm sure probably will never end, and that's the question of abortion. Okay, Senator, uh, my personal views and beliefs have no place in the resolution of any legal issues. I do not believe that as a nominee I can tell you how I might vote on a particular issue. It's just that I feel that it's improper for me to endorse or criticize that decision. Judge, I'm, I'm going to vote for you. I, I think you'll make a heck of a good judge. Um, but I'm a little disturbed about the reluctance to answer any questions. Um, <laughs> Within the Senate chamber, O'Connor's assertion of judicial independence was a virtue. And by the hearing's third day, she was widely thought to have a lot on the confirmation. But when it came to the demonstration in the street and the growing ideological divide over American values, no one could say for certain which side she was on. Naturally, 
to a person raised as Sandra Day had been. Miles from nowhere in the southeastern corner of Arizona, on a 160,000-acre cattle ranch called the Lazy Bean. It took a man on horseback a whole day just to ride across it. The Day family called it their own country, and it was. There was nobody else there. Arizona was really a frontier place in the 30s when she was growing up. So everybody had to pitch in. It was just a tiny little society in which she was an equal. She learned to fire a rifle when she was old enough to hold one, to drive a truck when she was about 10. You can't overstate the self-reliance you get growing up in a place like that. You solve your own problems, and the job isn't finished until it's finished. Well, good evening. As Gay said, my name is Trish Repo, and I have the great privilege to moderate this wonderful celebration uh, of the 40th anniversary of Justice O'Connor's swearing in at the United States Supreme Court. I was in law school when she was nominated and when she was sworn in. And it changed my world. And it changed the world for lots of women and certainly for lots of women lawyers. And I had the privilege last year because of COVID to not be sworn in in an ugly ballroom as president of the American Bar Association but rather to be sworn in here remotely on the patio of the Sandra Day O'Connor House by Arizona's Mary Schroeder, the first uh, Arizona woman, the first woman to, to be chief judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Um, so I am particularly excited to be here and delighted to welcome these amazing women, each of whom has not only seen history, but made a bunch of it, each of them uh, themselves. Gay has already introduced herself um, to you, and in the, uh, these are very short introductions because they all deserve hours. But Ambassador Barbara Barrett um, is a, a graduate of the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. She was the United States Ambassador to Finland. She, of course, was the 25th Secretary of the United States Air Force. She has a very long list of corporate and government and civic leadership uh, positions. And um, the Honorable Ruth McGregor, who, uh, as you all know, served as the Chief Justice of the State of Arizona, another graduate of what is now the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law, who began her law practice at the law firm of Thunder Craig, where John O'Connor was a leading partner and, of course, uh, had the great privilege to be one of Justice O'Connor's first law clerks. So let's get to it because we want to hear your stories. And Gay, um, we're going to start with you first because you, I believe, um, knew her the long, have known her the longest. So tell us how you got to meet and got to know Sandra Day O'Connor. Trish, are you saying that I'm the oldest and that's why you're starting with me? No, ma'am, you said you were the oldest when you started. <laughs> Um, my husband and I were transferred out here from New York in 1961. Of course, I was a very small child at the time, but that didn't work. And uh, it was fun to come out here from New York to the wild Indian country. My mother never got over it, but I certainly did and loved it. Um, it was a wonderful place to be, and there were some marvelous couples, including John and Sandra O'Connor. At that time, we all had children about the same ages. They were maybe in school together, but more, much more fun was Sandra was a good tennis player, a good golfer, a good skier, a good cook too. So we had a lot more in common. Also, we were in the uh, ranching business kind of at the time, and we could discuss cattle. I found out that I could change a tire on a dirt road faster than she could when <laughs> she was with her truck, but I had learned at a very young age she came to it. Oh, a little older than me. Anyway, we had a wonderful time. Um, it was fun because um, we were all young. I did not know how important she was, or John. It was just a very good time. And we kept that 
as a, as a nutshell of, of all of our friendship from then on. She went on, I kind of went this way, she went on. Now, it's your turn. <laughs> More later, okay. Oh, well, Barbara, you um, had the privilege to intern for her, right? When she was in the Arizona Senate, and you were uh, at ASU, am I right? That's right. Um, I was uh, in a state legislative intern um, in, the late, in the early 70s, and she was such a leader. She was someone who you could look up to, and for me as a college senior, she was really the icon of what women can do. I was from that era when women weren't, weren't uh, expected to be practicing law that much. It was, ooh. I am from the era of teacher, secretary, or nurse. And to have someone like Sandra O'Connor, not just in the position, but leading, doing more than anyone else in that position. First woman to be the majority leader of any state, house, or senate. Um, but most majority leaders would only have that role. If I recall correctly, she also was chairman of a committee, which is a highly unusual double duty. As I recall, it was a state, county, and municipal affairs committee, one of the busiest committees in the United States, in the Arizona State Senate. But also, while she did not support the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, because she found it not uh, to meet the standards that she would apply, she took that entire shelf, that probably 20 feet of volumes of the Arizona Revised Statute, and went through it page by page and gender neutralized the Arizona Revised Statutes. Substance over form. She was very much for equal rights for women. So the laws that said boys can go to work at six, uh, at 14, but girls have to wait till 16, not after Sandra Day O'Connor. Um, she was very much about substance, and she got a lot done. She got more done, multiple jobs at the same time, raising a family, um, practicing law on occasion. And, and I think it's significant that she was appointed to that position at first. She didn't that first run for it. The long time was here will remember that there was a senator by the name of Isabel Burgess, who Richard Nixon appointed to the National Transportation Safety Board to be the first woman on the NTSB, was a woman from Arizona. When Isabel Burgess got appointed to that post, they needed someone to replace that seat in the state senate. And, and they chose Sandra Day O'Connor. So uh, she did it, her access to that leadership role was not a politician seeking a post. It was that she was appointed to it, then she ran on her record and uh, served uh, in that Senate role on her, on her record as in successive occasions. So it's a, uh, it maybe is some demonstration of the sign of the times. Um, so Ruth, every female lawyer in America wanted the gig that you got. You got to be her first law clerk. Um, tell us, from your perspective, how that came about and what, uh, I mean, how cool was it really? It had to have been really, really cool. It was really, really cool. Um, <laughs> Well, you know, things happen in a strange way. Um, I, of course, had never practiced in front of her because John was a partner at Fenimore Craig. And so I knew her socially, not professionally. Um, when she was making her rounds and talking to senators, the Justice Department had prepared a briefing book for her on issues she might have to confront. And she came back to Arizona displeased with the briefing that she had gotten from the Justice Department. Now, and she asked, or some of us, I think, offered then to do some memos for her. So we spent the weekend in the, in the law library and we still had books and so forth and wrote memos. She was much more pleased. I learned many, many years later that the person in charge of her briefing book was a Mr. John Roberts, now Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. If I had known that, I might not have told the story, but it's too late now. So, um, and it was as part of that, in talking with her, that I started thinking about maybe being a law clerk for her. When I graduated from law school, 
I have no time for clerkships because I was 31 and I thought I was so very ancient, I really needed to get right to work. And so as I thought about it, talked to Bob about it, and we were leaving for a week on vacation. Now this is, of course, we didn't have cell phones, we didn't have email, we didn't have texting. I, there was no communication except about the room and telephones. And so I wrote a letter to her saying, you know, that if it would work, I would be willing to do this, I'd like to do this, I'd be honored to do it. And we left on vacation. At the same time, John O'Connor is talking with her and suggesting that I was someone he had worked with a lot, that she might want to ask me to be with her as a law clerk. So then I got home, when we got back, there were messages from her, we did have answering issues. And um, so I called right away and she said, I think we need to do this, is, is it okay with Bob? Of course she's checked on, on my husband. And I said yes, and, and so off I went to Washington. Um, I was there during the hearings. Uh, one of my sisters had driven out with me, and I had no idea until I saw the movie what a big ticket item that was. <laughs> but we took two of the spaces there and sat through the hearings, and then the year began. And um, who were the other clerks? Uh, the, the other three clerks had been hired by Justice Potter Stewart before he retired. Uh, one was from Harvard, one was from Columbia, and one was from Bull Hall. They were all wonderful. Uh, and she chose to keep them on. She would have had to, but she couldn't have found them better. They were just terrific. But none of them were from Arizona. No, no, no. They had all been waiting around all summer at the court. They actually gave them jobs as deputy clerks in the office of the clerk of court. Because until she was confirmed, nobody knew for certain, sure that they had a job. So they were there working and trying to anticipate what she would want them to do and what she would want from them. Um, so it was, a, it was a very minimal kind of period for them to do. So one of, the, um, one of the things that comes across both in the uh, PBS documentary and certainly in all the stories that we all know and have read about Sandra Day O'Connor is this so, like she never got the memo that women weren't supposed to do all the things that she did at, at the time that she did them. Um, she never seemed to be stopped by barriers, nor did she seem to have a lot of patience for people trying to stop other women with barriers at a time when there were still lots and lots and lots of barriers. Um, I would love for each of you to just sort of reflect on that and your thoughts and memories of examples of that piece of her from your time so far. Why don't we start with you? Okay, the truth comes out. Uh, Sandra always told me what to do. I mean, there was never any doubt. Uh, we're talking, you get to you. Uh, we're driving along in the car. I have lived here forever, and she's still telling me how to get to this grocery store. Or how to get gay gate in the left lane, gay to this, gay to this. So uh, when she went to the court, she had to um, diversify all of the clubs and things like that that she was a member of. And one of them was the Smithsonian. She was on the national board of the Smithsonian. So she called me up in D.C. just before she was sworn in. I think this. Mike's okay. Um, and he said, um, I need to put your name and nomination to be on the board of Smithsonian. I said, Sandra, I'm a little too busy right now. I can't do that. No, I'm going to put you on the name of the board. I said, Sandra, I really don't need this right now. My father just died. And we were in the midst of a whole bunch of legal problems. And um, then, of course, I would see her being interviewed on television by all of the very mean senators saying, what do you feel about women's rights? What do you feel about this? I know she was not comfortable with some of this. Anyway, um, I saw that and she called me the night and she said, I'm putting you on the name, put your name in nomination. So somebody I said, okay, okay, I'll do it. This is on the phone. She's in DC, I'm here. So I went to DC and I served on the Smithsonian board for six years. At that time, there were only three women, and the rest were all CEOs of very important companies. And uh, it was very interesting because I was a gopher, and that was the line of me at the time. 
So I'm ready to come home and really get back to work back here. And all of a sudden, I get a call from one of the important people. Uh, I can't remember it was the head of Scott Paper. And he said, Gay, we're putting your name in nomination to be the chairman of, of the Smithsonian. I said, oh, you must be kidding. Oh, no. I said, why me? He said, we need a softer, easier way of doing things. Well, I said, that's not me. So anyway, it didn't work out. And he said, I said, I can't do it. I'm sorry, I can't do it. He said, well, I'm pulling you for the next three months, and uh, we will make sure that you do do it. So I call Sandra, and I say, Sandra, I hope I've served you well in your position that I took over at, on the board. I hope I've served you well. She said, you've done a very good job. I said, but they've now asked me to be chairman. And she said, well, you would be the first woman, wouldn't you? Is there any doubt in your mind? Do it. <laughs> just not even nicely, she didn't say it. Like that. Just do it. I said, really? And she said, yeah, get it going. So I called him back and said, all right. I'm, I'm your person, and so I would see her in, in, in D.C. all the time because I was back there, I had family there. We had a wonderful time, but there was a lot of work to be done, and she was sure that I would do it. But that's my love of Sandra O'Connor. Do it. <laughs> well, another thing that she would say is, if you don't do it, it won't be a woman, will it? And so she was, um, she broke barriers, that's all well known, but she broke down barriers for other people too. So she was a part of something that Diane Rubling and I uh, shared in history, and that was a part of something called the Defense Advisory Committee on Women in the Services. And when she was on that as a civilian advisor for the Secretary of Defense, it was back at the time when women were not permitted to go to the military academies. Well, she broke that barrier down, and now, of course, Women are equally welcome at the military academies. I succeeded in her a decade, two decades after her time there, and on my occasion, uh, the issue was whether or not women should be permitted to fly fighters and bombers. And now, uh, Dakowitz broke down that barrier. But I think that maybe one of the things that the PBS um, would might lead you to. A, a wrong conclusion is it said something about how Arizona was, you know, she was raised a um, long ways from anywhere. She was in the middle of nowhere, and that uh, Arizona was just this uh, backward place at the time. But for women, Arizona has been a good state for a very long time. And people would forget that Lorna Lockwood was the Chief Justice of the Arizona Supreme Court. Uh, predecessor to, to Ruth in that role in the 60s uh, and 70s. Um, there were, women were very often in Arizona, there were more women in the legislature. Again, a place where Sandra uh, learned a lot and, and got a lot of her start. Um, there were always more women in the Arizona legislature than just about any other state. We were always in the top three. So women were taking leadership roles. Women were steamboat captains in Arizona in the, in the 1800s. And women, uh, it's a place where women have done well for a long time. It was in 2008 that we, the International, the Arizona Women's Forum did an event for Sandra, uh, for Justice O'Connor, and at that time, there was a woman on the United, she had just finished on the United States Supreme Court, an Arizona woman, but also Mary Schroeder was leading the U.S. Court of Appeals. The district court was, I think, Ross Silver at the time. The state court, Supreme Court, uh, Ruth was a member of the Supreme Court and Chief Justice, and the uh, state court of appeals, Sandra's seat had been succeeded with Sarah Grant, and Sarah became the chief judge of the Arizona Court of Appeals at all at the same, and Barbara Mandel and the county or, or municipal courts. So every court in Arizona uh, was led by a woman. A woman were, women were leading in each of those roles. So uh, I think Sandra opened doors for other women. She served as a role model for women, and she uh, inspired women to follow in her footsteps. So she indicated women can do this and have a family and succeed professionally. So I, uh, I think she, it, she was not so much about her power as it was that she was a real person to share power, to make, to empower others, both by example and by um, 
gender neutralizing the statutes and opening other doors. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and Gay, when you talk about how she was quick to tell people what to do, it, it's how I met um, Chief Justice McGregor that long ago because I was at an American Bar Association event in uh, Washington with the justice, and she found out, figured out that I was from Arizona. And um, I, I don't think she quite poked me in the chest as she said this, but she came close. And there was an issue here at the time with respect to merit selection about which she felt very strongly. And I, I, I may have met, but we certainly were not friends at that point. This was some years back. And she took me aside at this American Bar Association event, and she said, when you go back to Arizona, I want you to call Ruth McGregor and you tell her that I said for you to call her. And you tell her you will do whatever she wants you to do <laughs> to address this merit selection problem. And I called you and I repeated that, right? So, um, so tell us some stories from you about her power for other women. Well, it, a couple of, oh, maybe a year or two ago, uh, a group of her law clerks were asked to write an article for the Ninth Circuit magazine. Uh, they, they have a publication. So I got together uh, comments from law clerks that really spanned her quarter century on the court. And it was interesting because everybody had a little different perspective, but everybody mentioned how she encouraged them and served as a role model and got them to do things and, and said, you know, if you don't, who will? Um, and she was so good at encouraging. And she didn't, she didn't limit it to young women. Uh, she would, she, she had, a, I think it's a unique ability to see what kind of push somebody needs and what will make a difference. Uh, one of my favorite stories from the first term uh, involved not young women, but young men who were law students. And the way she encouraged them was amazing. Um, it all started because she wanted to make a casserole that called for tomatillos. And in Washington, in 1981, tomatillos were hard to come by. I lived near a place called the Sutton Place Gourmet, which was the first kind of upscale grocery store with unusual things. So I suggested perhaps we could find tomatillos there. So off we went. We finally found some of a can, but at least they were tomatillos. And as we were checking out, the young man bringing us up said, as so many people did, you look like Justice O'Connor. And she would say, well, that's because I am. So I took a little slip of paper, asked her to sign it, she did. And after we finished bringing up our groceries, there was a long line of people waiting. And he just took our bags to carry them out to the car because he didn't think she should be carrying her own groceries. Well, that might have ended it, except the next day, the Sutton Place Gourmet also had its own chocolates. And here to the, the court in crew nine eleven days were delivered two boxes of chocolates, one for Justice O'Connor and one for me. Well, this wouldn't do. She needed to have something special for him. And so she sent me back to the Sutton Place Gourmet to invite him and another of his friends to come and listen to arguments at the court. Now, he was attending American University, his friend was attending Howard, they were both from the Outer Banks of North Carolina. And she had them come to an argument day and sit in the special seats for the guests of the justices. So these two young men sat there all during argument, and when it was over, she had me bring them back to her chambers, and she and I and the two young law students had lunch. And i you can only imagine the way they felt as they left the court. It was something nobody knew about. It didn't gain her anything. Uh, she didn't get a good article written about her. But she had that ability to recognize in someone that with a little encouragement, something special might happen. Um, and I saw her do that over and over, with, especially with young women law students who literally would get stars in their eyes, um, who were so excited to, to see her, to be with her, to listen to her, to hang up every word that she said. So the notion of, you know, her barriers were done. She could get what she wanted. 
But I can recall just sitting with her at a board meeting of an organization and they were talking about new board members and after somebody had suggested so well, then you know she would just say, Well, I didn't hear any women's names. And so immediately the conversation would start over. She she really helped so many people break down barriers and get to something new that they might have not had enough courage to do without her without her support. Well, and she obviously had a personal impact in, in so many ways and, uh, on, on so many people. It, my itty bitty story is the first occasion on which I answered my office telephone. And because of the ABA work we were doing together, it was Justice O'Connor on the other side of the phone. She identified herself. We spoke, I'm going to go maybe three minutes, maybe three and a half. And it was only when I hung up the phone that I became self-aware that I had stood up behind my desk when I heard her voice. <laughs> And I had remained standing during the entire conversation. <laughs> but she had that impact on people. I'm sure all of you saw examples of that. Did she like being the first? Did she like being the rock star? I think she loved being the rock star. It came with some bad, you know, the, the constant attention and the never being able to do anything in public without people paying attention. But it, it's related to the, what we were talking about, to breaking down barriers for other people. It was because of her position that she could do that. It was because of her position she could have a voice in judicial systems that were being set up all across the, all across the, the world. And so in that sense, I think she quite enjoyed it. Um, I know there were times when she wished that you know, she could just once walk down the street without people seeing her. But it was so important to her to, to have that ability to help other people get reach their goals. But I think it was OK. Do either of you have a reflection uh, on that point of whether she enjoyed the, the, the business of being Sandra Day O'Connor? On the dance on the dance floor, definitely. She liked being, uh, she was, she and John were wonderful dancers, and, and Washington found that out the easy way, because they were invited to every evening. Every time I'd go to D.C., my family was there, we'd go out there, and they would be, I don't know how she did, the energy she had was phenomenal. Working all day, dancing all night, and, and having a family, and, and cooking, the whole, the whole thing was just absolutely amazing. Yes. I think Rockstar would not be as kind of a, I would say, princess, something <laughs> along that line. That's what I would say, a, a kinder word. But yes, she very definitely liked being not the attention necessarily the press and things like that, but definitely she could make things work very, very well when she was in that position. And it was kind of fun to see. You know, she wrote uh, the book about her time on the court. Uh, the majesty of the law. I always thought maybe the first word was wrong. I think it's her majesty of the law, and uh, she really was the leader uh, that, that brought majesty to the law, and she worked hard to do that, uh, to have it in a majestic way. But the law is what she uh, looked to with majesty. Well, you've had the opportunity to, um, to observe the, the Sandra Day O'Connor on the international stage in a way that few people, right? Few people did, and she was, um, uh, if, if it's possible to be a bigger deal than she was here in this country, it might be elsewhere in the world. She was so admired, um, is so admired, and is so revered. Um, reflect on that from, from your unusual uh, vantage point to see that. Well, I can talk about her visit to Finland when I served as ambassador, just after I served as ambassador. She was invited to come to Finland. Um, she, it was on a long list of international trips that she made. Um, it wasn't just when she was in the court that she was internationally inclined. Was it the Crown Prince of Swaziland that she hosted at her at the home that now is right here uh, through the International Visitors Program? So when she was local, she was already uh, involved in international hospitality, in home hospitality, which means so much 
and still does. Arizona is very frequently uh, one of the top places that international visitors are sent because of our propensity to offer up home hospitality. She did that. But then with the law, she went, for instance, to Finland and met with the president of the Supreme Administrative Court advancing rule of law, advancing the concept of an independent judiciary, taking these basic core concepts and evangelizing for the way that a judiciary properly works. And she was, of course, revered, and it meant a lot. Uh, I had been chair of the President's Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy. When you think about ways of having diplomacy, having someone carry the message of democracy, as she was able to do, uh, into nations large and small, sophisticated and not so much. Uh, she traveled the world in, on some occasions, she was Justice O'Connor, but she was tolerant of some pretty rustic environments, and, but she was there to evangelize about having a judiciary that really works with an independence and, uh, and following the rule of law. Hard to imagine a, a better evangelist than, than she was on those deeply important topics. I mentioned one other occasion when on the international stage, Condoleezza Rice, when she was Secretary of State, asked to team up with Sandra O'Connor and host a three-day summit on justice, where she brought the justice ministers and Supreme Court justices or counterparts in whatever the fashion of that country was from all over the world. The women who were in those roles invited them all to Washington, and they and she led with Secretary Rice, Condoleezza Rice, uh, a, a mission to have greater solidarity the familiarity that comes from knowing others in other countries that face similar problems. Uh, she was the leader to do that kind of thing, and she did that with Secretary Rice. One more example of uh, helping other women to overcome, uh, overcome barriers. Um, Gay, not everybody knows uh, your stories about how they went. <laughs> no, not everybody knows your stories, period. That's true. But, um, I, I, anyway, would love to hear you talk about how the house came to be here and how you talked with her about that and so sort of share with us how that came about and how she felt of it. Well, Barbara is my witness because she was there at the same time. If she tells a different story, trust me, it's my story. <laughs> it was 2004. The Secretary of the Smithsonian, um, Larry Small, came to Phoenix, and um, as most of us, I didn't know at the time, the um, head region of the Smithsonian is the Chief Justice, as he is Sandra's boss when she was at the court. So I uh, invited Sandra and John to come for lunch, and Barbara was a brand new, I had suckered her into being on the board of the Smithsonian, and she was brand new there too. We had a wonderful lunch, and Larry Small was talking about all the buildings that the Smithsonian Center is interested in, and then that some of them are breaking down and that they'd have to be repaired. And as Sandra said, our house is going to be demolished. And I looked at her and I said, you mean the one in Denton Lane? She said, yes, they're gonna demolish it. it. It's gonna be gone. Well, she mentioned it twice. Barbara has another story and she mentioned it three times. But anyway, um, she mentioned it, and I look at Barbara, and she looks at me, and Barbara says, where's the house? And I said, I'll meet you there in half an hour after this luncheon was over. Your turn. <laughs> well, one of the things that she said at that time was, and in this auditorium, in this building, uh, it's an important statement that she made. She said, Arizona doesn't appreciate her history. And I thought, well, we can't let that stand. Uh, we've got to correct that. If that's the perception she has, we must be, it may be a, a shortcoming that we need to correct. And so we thought maybe this would be a time to correct that Arizona, to demonstrate that Arizona does appreciate our history. And so what do we need to do? What can you do for Justice O'Connor? There's nothing you can do for her. She, what she has done for the nation, what she's done for the state, what she's done for the gender, what she's done for the profession, what she's done for the nation. There is no repaying it, of course, but if there's something that means something to her heart, like they're gonna bulldoze my house, if we could figure out a way to keep that from happening, 
and demonstrate that Arizona does, at least to some extent, appreciate our history. This would be a way to demonstrate it. So Gay and I teamed up and a lot of others, and then I left town. <laughs> Quite true. Well, she mentally, uh, physically left town, mentally she didn't. Um, anyway, we went to the house and we looked at the neighborhood, and as Scott and Joan know, it's not a neighborhood where you want 50 million cars driving up to a museum. And then we began to think, okay, now what are we going to do? So we went and found out who owned the house, how we would work it. They were not interested until we all of a sudden said, well, maybe for a tax deduction, if you gave the house, it would work and we could make something. But meanwhile, if we did that, we had to form a 501c3 of some sort. What were we going to call it? The Sanders House? No, we were going to call it that. We were going to call it something much more interesting, like the Institute. So we started with that. And then we said, well, where are we going to move it? Well, that was, and how are we going to move it? Barbara did leave town at that point. That we were bulldozers. No. But there were a number of wonderful people that helped. The wonderful mayor of Tempe, Hugh Holman, who gave us in the back row with his wonderful mother, who was here too, gave us an option of where to put it. A wonderful lady, Janie Ellis, whose father had been originally helped them build the house in the 50s, was also helping us. And all of a sudden, we had an opening. Barbara's still out of town, of course, doing her fancy stuff. But anyway, she did help me at all levels. And thanks to Hugh Holman, we found the place right here around the corner, which is wonderful, with a water feature and the whole thing. Now we had to get it there. It took us four years. We started in 2004. I think by 2008, we were finished, maybe. Nine. Nine, thank you. I knew you um, and, and there it was, the house in a wonderful, wonderful area, which has become a national, a national shrine, to be honest with you. And what was her reaction to, to this idea that you are cooked up? You know that. Do it. Do it. <laughs> do it and do it now. There was no question. I mean, is a, she wasn't going to help me move it, that was for sure. She was busy in music. Uh, or busy doing, but at that point, um, it was a you know, we had a wonderful, wonderful house. But moving this house was not easy. There were all these wonderful uh, uh, adobe bricks that were just there, and we only broke five. Is that correct? I think five. Does that number sound right? Five is correct. Thank you. Only broke five. We had to number each one of them and move them slowly, slowly, slowly. And then we had to make it so that the public would come into the house, which is a whole different thing. We have a home as opposed to a house that people can come into. We were just there today and had a wonderful time today. It was, it was terrific. It still is a place people want to be in important occasions, such as your swearing in, correct? Great, great. That was a great treat. And, and you know, that uh, was just the first um, of any number of things, of course, that have been named after her, including your law school uh, is now named after her. So talk, talk about that. Uh, talk about how it came to be that uh, the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law was at the time, and I believe still is, the only law school in the United States named after a woman who didn't write a check for the rights. I'm, I'm sorry, it's a very big deal. And so there is St. Mary's. Um, but at the time, and Scott and the family are well aware, people over the years wanted to name a lot of things. The O'Connor this, or the O'Connor that, the Justice O'Connor this and that. And she was quite careful, as was her family, about what her name should be attached to. So it was during the time when actually the first woman to serve as dean of a law school in Arizona, Trish White, was dean at ASU. And the initial idea came from Trish that it would be a wonderful tribute, both by the state and by the university, to name the law school the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. There were a lot of barriers to doing this, and Trish did not give up. And in the meantime, she enlisted me and probably others uh, to, to try to help convince Sandra that this would be a good idea. 
And she didn't agree immediately. Oh, that's a wonderful idea. She wanted a lot of information about the lawsuit. What are their plans? How are they dealing with women? What are they going to do about getting more people to come to law school, be more, you know, encourage people from different backgrounds? What are their plans for growth? How are they going to manage it? You know, what are they doing for the students? She had a lot of questions, as you would guess, and she got a lot of information. And finally, one day, one of my various times when I was gently trying to, you know, you can't push her too hard because the jump push back. But when I was gently trying to find out what she was going to do, she finally said, well, I think I'm going to do this. So then Trish and I set up a meeting with Michael Crow, who of course had, knew that this had been going on and had approved it. And so we went in, and those of you who know, know Michael Crow can imagine, he can't just accept the good news. He had a whole argument ready for why she should allow the law school to be named for her. And he kept talking so long, I was afraid he would talk her off. But, but at the end, she agreed that the law school could be named for her. And she has stayed so interested in the law school and what is going on. And it is, um, it is a wonderful tribute to her. And it's also an important learning thing for the students. Because if you're going to graduate from law school with her name on it, you should be thinking about how you can do public service, about how you can make the profession better. You should do something to make to continue to be proud of that name is on the law school. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it, I, am I right that it's still the only law school named after a woman? I think it is, in her own right. Um, I, I, I think that, I think that's still true. I'm sure it's the only one named without having uh, lots and lots of money right. to, to buy the right to name. <laughs> right, right, and probably so. Um, so we're we're coming a little bit to the end here, but um, I want us to talk. Um, about the documentary of which we saw nine minutes at the front end. Um, if you haven't uh, seen it, you can watch it online and it's worth your while. Um, it, it, it reminded me of all kinds of things and caused me to reflect on all kinds of things as I bet it did each of you. One of which for me was wondering whether any justice will ever again be approved 99 to 0 by the United States Senate. Whether we just move to a place as a country where that just won't happen again. Um, so that was my reflection, but I'd like to hear from each of you what struck you as you watched the documentary. Okay? I need to put a plug in for the Institute, though. The House started the Institute. Well, where are we going to go with the house? We're going to sit there and have tea? I didn't think so. That's not Sandra. Her legacy was most important to us at this time. Yes, the house, and yes, all of the stories. But the legacy was most important. This is what the Institute protects more than anything. To me, this is what it's all about. And I can tell you, your sense of humor is still right up there. I, I have told this joke maybe around. So, I try to talk to her maybe every 10 days. Well, okay, Sandra, what have you been doing? Okay, I've been playing bingo. I said, Sandra, uh, the American public does not want to hear that they're justice and they're gambling. <laughs> and she said, well, gay, there's no money. I said, well, then what are we playing for? She said, chocolates, and will you bring me another bo a box of seeds right away? <laughs> and that's, I mean, she just has this sense of humor which goes on and on. It's one of the best stories. I say it every time. More chocolates? Oh, yes. She said, oh, yes. Thank you. But the Institute is there to protect and to always make sure that everything, including the filming, and as a matter of fact, I don't think I'm letting any secrets out. There is a group uh, across the country that wants to do a musical on Sandra O'Connor. Well, I talked to them briefly, especially the head guy. I said, listen, this is not Hamilton. I want no rap. This is a woman that you are going to respect. And I have all their numbers of all, uh, who's writing it and who's doing all of what they want to do. But I said, this is, this, is not, uh, this is not a Harvard Lampoon guy. I said, this better be pretty important, because if you're doing it, we're making sure that it is as 
as she loves music, she's the best dancer, she knows the words to every song that she's ever danced to. And I said, gentlemen, and there's one lady, I said, we need more ladies on board because Sandra would like it that way. So let's find out, and I will be able to tell, tell you in the next couple of months where this thing is gonna happen. But a musical for Sandra O'Connor, she would love it. You know that. <laughs> Now that's a reflection, but it's, it's coming in, in, in the future, and the Institute will protect her at all levels. I promise you that. And, and you heard about the musical here first. <laughs> Heavens knows what it's going to be called. It, it can't be first, maybe it can't be second, yes. you know. What's it going to be? Anyway. Yes. Is, is that what they want to call us, ladies? Did you talk to them? His name is Arizona Theater Company of Premier Society Spring. Promise? Yes. Okay, all right. <laughs> thank you, Bob. Okay, thank you. There you go. Barbara, did you have a, any reflection or anything that, that, that um, came to you as you watched the documentary? One of the things that it didn't capture, uh, maybe as much as it might, is her sense of humor. And, and how much fun was, that she was to be around. And she made fun. She made things fun. Ever the judge, she and I went to a county fair in Montana one time ever the judge. We were walking through the cattle barn and she was evaluating the calves and disagreeing with who got the blue ribbon and who got the red ribbon, re-evaluating re how they should have done that. With the house, and the house was built, was taken down brick by brick and rebuilt brick by brick. And after the bricks were laid and the mortar um, around, you know, obvious, um, bricks and mortar put together. The way for an adobe house to be finished is to have a thin gruel, as she described it, of the adobe to be brushed over it. Well, Sandra O'Connor, what would she do? She had a mud slinging party and came over and personally took a hand of a paintbrush and slashed, slushed the um, mud on the walls of the, of the O'Connor house here. She was one inclined to have fun. She was fun to be around. She had fun, and everyone else around her would have fun, too. Yeah, that's a great comment about it not capturing her sense of humor. There was, seeing her laugh when she was really tickled by something, which was often a bad joke by John, or maybe my husband, and, I mean, she would just be so tickled, and she has the greatest, she has the greatest laugh. One of the things that struck me in watching it, at, uh, you know, her hearings and everything, very much the judge. But I love the old movies of the family and building a house and the boys running around and playing tennis and fishing and everything because I thought, you know, somebody mentioned this earlier, we forget that out of all those ordinary parts of life, somebody really extraordinary comes when we need them. And I just thought that the film did a good job of showing that um, well, we are, we are wrapping up here uh, on a wonderful celebration of the 40th anniversary, and so I warned you I would do this, but closing thoughts, Gay, briefly. It's hard for me to be brief, you know that. Um, That's why I but, said briefly. <laughs> <laughs> there has been no, nobody like her. Um, I was at it. A dinner the other night, and somebody said, well, who are the three main people that have influenced your life? Well, there was my ex-husband, and um, there was very definitely the Dalai Lama and <laughs> Sandra O'Connor. And they looked at me and they said, we'll pick Sandra O'Connor, you can keep the other two jobs. <laughs> Thank you. I just say what I was uh, asked to participate in the space program and train as a backup for, for space travel. The first person that I talked to was Sandra O'Connor to find out what she thought about signing up for something where you're destined to be the uh, backup. And uh, that was a, a first a conversation and somebody that, uh, whose judgment I trusted completely. Some years ago, at one of the first O'Connor Justice Prize dinners, Justice Stu uh, Souter gave a toast, a tribute to Justice O'Connor. 
And he started his remarks by saying, we've all heard the reasons we should admire Justice O'Connor. I'm going to tell you why we should love her. And I hope tonight we've conveyed some of that. She was so extraordinary in so many ways, and yet, at base, we all just love her. On that note, please join me in thanking our extraordinary friends.